All right, I think we are live. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this very, very important conversation tonight about monuments and about the larger conversation about one, what monuments actually mean. My name is Ariel Gray. I am the arts engagement producer for The Artery. We are the arts and culture uh, team for WBUR. And I am joined by a panel of some very amazing artists, but you know, I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, first, I wanna thank uh, WBUR City Space and the BU Arts Initiative for um, putting together this event. Um, if you guys are unfamiliar, WBUR City Space is our home uh, for civic engagement in the city of Boston. If you guys are looking for informative events, um, events that kind of keep up the pace to what's going on in the real world, definitely make sure that you follow City Space. Um, the BU Arts Initiative is a university-wide interdisciplinary hub um, that supports programming and research um, here in Boston. So yes, thank you to these very amazing organizations for putting together this conversation tonight. Um, the other thing that we definitely want to acknowledge before we go ahead and get started is, um, you know, we always like to do a land acknowledgement. So as we gather tonight, um, we would like to acknowledge that the land that we are meeting on today virtually, uh, you know, is the traditional unceded homeland of the Massachusetts people and their neighbors, the Nipmuc and Wampanoag people. We acknowledge the painful history of settler colonialism, genocide, and forced removal from this territory. And we honor and respect that many indigenous people still connected to this land, um, that there are so many indigenous people still connected to this land on which we gather. If you are in the audience and you have a question, feel free to go to slido.com. So we actually have an event code set up called public art. So you just go to slido.com and you can actually submit your question. Just make sure to use that event code, which is again, public art. Okay. And then I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panelists. Thank you guys for being so patient as I got, went through that list of, of, uh, of itinerary stuff to start off with. So first off, we have Paul Farber, who is the artistic director and co-founder of the Monument Lab and the senior research scholar at the Center for Public Art and Space at the University of Pennsylvania, Stuart Weitzman School of Design. Thank you so much, Paul, for joining us tonight. Uh, second, we have Lamurchi Fraser, Boston's own. Um, she is the director of education at the Museum of African American History in Boston and um, an artist in the African American Master Artist in Residence program at Northeastern University. Uh, it's located in Jamaica Plain. Joel Garcia, thanks again. Um, he is joining us from the West Coast. He is an artist, arts administrator, and cultural organizer. He is also a fellow at the Intercultural Leadership Institute and Monument Lab. And then lastly, but certainly not least, we have Mabel Wilson, Professor of Architecture and African American and African Diasporic Studies. Um, she is also the Director of the Institute for Research in African American Studies at Columbia University. So again, uh, thank you all so much for taking the time to join us for this conversation tonight. I think we all know that this is um, a dialogue that has been uh, obviously happening, but right now it's bubbling to the surface with everything that's going on. Um, and again, for the audience, really quick, if you have a question, make sure to go to slido.com and use the code public art. Um, so I kind of want to get us started off on a base ground because there may be some folks who are joining us who aren't quite sure what um, a monument is and what public art is. So um, actually, Paul, I'm going to ask you, could you actually give us like a loose definition of, of a monument um, and what you found that to mean in your work? Yeah, well, first of all, I want to just express gratitude to all of the panelists and, and uh, for being here tonight. Um, in Monument Lab, we've defined monument as a statement of power and presence in public. I and mean, one of the reasons that we've done that is that, of course, uh, when you say monument, you may think about bronze and marble. I may think about kind of ideas that we've often inherited that monuments um, depict single figures. They're above us. They're timeless, so to speak. Uh, but we know that history is far more complicated. Than that, that there's so much more to the story. In fact, that um, many monuments actually work to suppress uh, more complex histories, especially of resistance, of freedom narratives. Um, so we also know of um, forms of art, whether they are inscribed into public spaces um, or expressed or echoed. And so, you know, that definition of a, a statement of power and presence in public 
is meant to encompass the traditional monuments as well as those that are people powered. Because we found that time and again, if you have the time, the money and the power to build a monument that's important to you, you do it. But if you don't have the time, the money or the power, you still can gather near a monument that exists to amplify your presence and make your voice heard. And all of that um, to us is monumental. Mm, thank you so much for that definition. And Joel, I actually want to pass this to you, given the recent article in the Los Angeles Times and um, some of your work that you've been doing about um, developing a non-hierarchical process when it comes to monuments. Can you talk a little bit about what, what, what the definition of monument is for you um, working out in Los Angeles? Um, yeah, to echo what Paul said, but also what erasure, you know, it, it is a statement of erasure of, of not wanting to reconcile with the, you know, with the history of a place. You, to know that at least the ones that are in contention now here in LA, um, none of those monuments were put up by the city or the county. They were gifted. Here, here's, here's, um, here's our story and you know, you're going to put it up in a public space to reinforce dominance. Um, the Cerro statue was gifted. The Columbus statue was gifted. Those were impositions on our community. So a lot of it is, is you know, attributed to erasure of Native peoples. Um, and Mabel, I did want to hear from you a little bit um, about your point of view when it comes to monuments, given the work that you have been doing in erecting monuments that tell a different type of history. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Paul's definition is an excellent one because it has everything to do with presence and power. And precisely what Joel said about erasure is also important because some voices get amplified at the expense of others. Um, and in many ways, that's very deliberate. And from my experience, both as a designer, imagining um, memorials in the future, but also adjudicating various uh, monuments around the city. Um, on a, a, I served on a mayor's commission. I mean, it was clear straight off the bat that it was really about domination and the kinds of narratives that describe civic space, which is often at the expense of other people's sense of belonging. Thank you, Mabel. Um, and speaking of sense of belonging, um, Lamerchi and I are both based in Boston and um, I think we've been having the same conversation here that's been going on across the country, but perhaps a little bit different because Boston has this liberal reputation, right? Um, so Lamerchi, I'm wondering from your perspective, um, how do you feel, what place do you feel monuments have in Boston and what type of purpose have they served in the city? Oh, I think you're muted, Lamerchi. I think you may be muted. <laughs> Um, I think that um, monuments are a investment in memory and that the act of remembering is a catalyst for self-recovery. Um, and in Boston, it being a, a very pivotal and catalytic city of America emerging from the 1600s forward, uh, gives it that space of who's being represented. So in considering uh, Boston's a dialogue in monuments and vested in the, the power of these large looming pieces of work, you have the ethics of representation that it could be considered. And what is the discourse? What are the people bringing to it as their, either their mythological understanding of history or the history that is truly a part of the mirror of community? And so um, I, I think that uh, Boston has had uh, many instances of uh, racial discourse, racial uh, discontent, um, and the, the narrative based in uh, white supremacy and white possessiveness as its logic uh, tends to uh, cast it in a narrative of uh, the dominant narrative and not one that is expansive. And so as we look at these, uh, these voices that have been looming in the monuments, we have to consider who freedom is talking about, if it's speaking to that, um, and who is, is the organizer to make this happen. Um, and the consideration that 
in the 1800s, it was black people who are Gotcha. And Lamerti, I think we're maybe having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Um, I'm not quite sure what happened, but let's see if we can maybe try to troubleshoot that a little bit. Um, but I'm going to go on to, to the next question. And I think this is something that's really interesting. Obviously, now, um, you know, with the deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, there's been an influx in conversation about monuments and not just conversation. We've also seen action, right? We've seen folks tearing down monuments, vandalizing monuments, or demanding that they be removed. But I'm also interested to hear about the people who want these monuments to stay. And I'm wondering if anybody can speak to why people are so invested in, um, in these monuments that actually don't really accurately reflect our history as a, as, as a nation. And that's kind of a throwaway to anyone. I can share something interesting. With the Columbus statue last year, when it was removed, or would it be like going on two years now, um, there was opposition for folks to keep it up. But once it came down, like nobody wanted anything to do with it, except the Catholic Church. They obviously wanted it. So one of the things that we learned was like, all right, there's this catharsis that happens when it comes down, right? That people feel that their identity is going to be questioned, or that it's going to disappear, that their faith will be challenged somehow. So that's something that we banked on with this, with the when we toppled the Sarah statue was that. There might be some folks who might, at the moment, you know, oppose it. But once it comes down, like, what happens? Like, what, what, what is their personal response? And very similar, when the statue was about to come down, you know, the security guards were running, screaming. But once it came down, it was like, a, you know, it was, it was a moment of peace. And it took them a little bit to reflect on, like, OK, not, not like my, my identity is intact. My faith is intact. So what is it exactly that I was holding on to by wanting this monument to like stay erected? Um, and then the conversation changes to something else. But it, it, for me, it was really learning about, you know, how folks responded in that moment is just say like, OK, it was a release of sorts. Um, and then helping folks at that moment understand because they're in a vulnerable state, you know, and for me, part of part of part of how the whole ceremony removing the statue and Sarah was about that, helping people bridge to what comes after, instead of leaving a void of that will turn to anger, turn to frustration, um, you know. And at some point, acceptance of like this is this is the history of this place. Um, the following weekend, up in San Fernando, in front of, in front of another Sarah statue, where there was a creative action. When we arrived at the place, there was a, an older man protecting the statue. He was standing in front of the statue. Um, and so I approached him, approached him, had a conversation with him about what we were going to do, um, promised him that the statue wouldn't come down that day because at that point it was important for the tribal nations to remove it, not just, you know, just, a, just any community member. Um, and he agreed with us. And, he, like, he didn't agree with, with why we were doing it, but he agreed in the action itself. And he helped, he helped other Catholic folks who came to, to that protest or to that action help understand what we were doing. You know, and even as the statue was being covered with, with black plastic, um, you know, he, had to, he helped them understand that, that their faith isn't being challenged. It's not their faith that's being challenged. It's, it's a reconciling with history that needs to happen. And, I, you know, for me, that's been very fascinating kind of to, to explore and have conversations with folks who still think these monuments should, you know, be, you know, be in place. I mean, I, I'd like to maybe follow up with that as well, because I, I think there are a range of reasons as to why people 
um, would like to preserve monuments. Sometimes it's just aesthetic. They simply like it. Um, it's always been there. And I think it's the always been there that helps support this idea of timelessness, right? And that, you know, that, that this is exactly history and my heritage. But in fact, our perceptions are always changing and our values are always changing. And therefore, I think it's really important to continually reevaluate why these particular things are representing our shared values uh, in public space. And, and an, I think an excellent example for me are Confederate monuments, or what people call Confederate monuments, but I prefer to call them American monuments, because citizens of the Confederate States of America did not erect those monuments. Americans did. They put them in American public space. So we have to ask ourselves, why was it that Americans felt that these were their values, and are they still our American values today? Um, and actually, Mabel, to that point, you're talking about Confederate statues. We actually got in a question from John. Um, so he's asking, taking down Confederate monuments erases the history. If you want to get people to talk about slavery, shouldn't we leave the monuments up so we're, we are reminded? I don't know if anyone has a response to that question. Um, it's kind of a loaded question, I think, but Paul, I see you've unmuted yourself. I don't know if you want have something to say. Yeah, um, you know, I think back to uh, an important, um, important conversation that the late Nobel laureate Toni Morrison had during the writing of um, the book Beloved. Um, and she gives uh, a, an interview a conversation, and I'll paraphrase, um, that she says, there's no place you and I can go or not go to summon the absence of enslaved peoples. There's no sky, there's no monument, there's no skyscraper lobby, um, there's no bench by the road. Um, and so the book had to do the work. And since she said that um, in the late 1980s, we still live in a country that has no official national monument or memorial to enslaved peoples. We have some sites as a part of the National Park Service system. Um, there's a, a, a wonderful new-ish institution on the National Mall, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. But we've never done a full reckoning um, in regards to not just slavery in the past, but the legacies of enslavement, um, uh, segregation, um, redlining. And that's not even the full reckoning um, more broadly, right? And so the past is not something that's stuck in the past. I bring that up because I also want to echo um, Professor Wilson's notion that the, the building of Confederate monuments were done by residents of the United States in places that the Confederacy didn't exist um, at a moment that uh, in, uh, coincided with Black freedom uh, movements and empowerment and, and also uh, the Jim Crow and civil rights era. So I would say, I want to give that context. I'm going to just go to the notion that there um, it's important to not erase the struggle. I've seen a number of cities over the last few years when we could travel, BC before COVID, I would go to see cities that have removed monuments either to the Confederacy or other um, racist symbols and systems. And in general, what you would find, even if you knew that there was um, stories of struggle, there's always an activist, there's always an artist, if not a, a larger community that has pushed a municipality to change. But that was all wiped away. So I hope that municipalities will follow in the regard of like what's happening right now on Monument Avenue, where there's people powered commemoration. I went there a few weeks ago. It's, it's powerful to see um, how a spaces are healing, but also monuments have done harm. They're actively doing harm. So how do we act urgently and rush toward repair, toward acknowledgement, toward a fuller reckoning and also systems of equity that are not just symbolic, but connecting our symbols and systems and not rush to find one solution. We have to listen to what people are saying on the ground and, and what they're doing. So there's there's a lot more to say about it. I'm sure I haven't covered it all, but that's just a overall kind of echo of, of the conversation. Right. I back to that, I hope you can hear me. Um, Yes, we can hear you much better now. Okay, wonderful. Um, I want to say that 
with respect to monuments and what they raise as storied places, these um, those that are representative of something that has happened, people, places, and events attached to a space. Um, the way we occupy space and tell stories is an investment in these, uh, these monuments. And so uh, the representation that is there um, in those of those places that are um, uh, erecting monuments that are not even about their communities are um, lifting voices that uh, may not be ones of honor. And so with the questions that we go to these monuments with, they should include, are your voices being lifted here? Are your faces being lifted here? Is your past as you know it being lifted here? And the, the, the democratization of that space being one based in uh, surveying uh, individuals and what they think um, about before a monument is put in play. Um, the idea that there is an informed public uh, about what they want to see and what they, uh, what they cherish is something that should be considered in what is erected in a monument. We have recently in, in Boston had the call for uh, the erection of a Martin Luther King, Coretta Scott King memorial. And it is Frank, uh, it is Hank Willis Thomas who was awarded uh, the um, sculpture that he presented, the embrace, to be put on a Boston Common. And that project King Boston was uh, levied through communities to get feedback from the public uh, about what they felt were the five top, as they looked at the five top uh, entries that were juried, they had comments. And it was very interesting how each person brings a different view. Um, and, and then looking at that, how we respond with public money to erecting something or having the opportunity for the public to engage in what's selected. The, um, the uh, monument that is really uh, one that responds to the issue about how slavery is thought about in this country, for me, rings in um, the Statue of Liberty as a gift from France and uh, representing this idea of liberty or, and uh, the first one being one that was of an African, um, uh, an African woman who had been formerly enslaved and um, <laughs> she holding a light. That one was rejected by America and sent to the island of Martinique. It is then that we get the, uh, the Statue of Liberty that we know as Ellis Island that represents, um, that represents liberty and opening the doors and the arms to all your poor and hungry and um, this idea of um, the dominant narrative still being a part of that sculpture in its presence, its face, its physical features. So um, the idea that we live in a 500 shared history, have 500 year shared history of the tensions of, um, uh, of racism and whose voices are being reflected is a part of this call for uh, the new monuments, new voices to be raised. And um, I worked with teams who uh, were in a project with me called New Urban Monuments, Stand Up Inside Yourself, uh, taken from a poem by Rita Dove. Um, and it, it was really amazing to see with um, the implements of augmented reality, how they reimagine the monuments that are uh, on, the, on the common in Boston and other uh, speak to realities or non-realities um, that they researched and then wanted to stand up people who were not recognized in their full humanity in these uh, monuments. So it's an ongoing non-static conversation um, as Ms. Wilson, as Dr. Wilson had said, to us that um, we are uh, reviewing these notions constantly and having new voices to enter in the conversation is very important. 
Um, and we have another question here that actually I think I kind of want to direct to, to Mabel, given um, the work that you've done on a memorial uh, that you know depicts enslaved persons um, and again tells an alternate history. So this is this question is from Mel. Um, this person asks, what are all alternative ways to think about spatial memorialization? How can we expand memorial definitions? Well, um, that's a great question from, from Mel. Um, I was on a team um, uh, led by the Boston architects, um, Howler and Yoon, Meijin Yoon and Eric Howler. Um, and we had a phenomenal team and did an amazing amount of community engagement and community work for the University of Virginia, built by Thomas Jefferson and built by enslaved labor. And the monument, uh, the memorial opened about, um, about six weeks ago, unofficially. Um, and it's called the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers. And one of the things that I think is remarkable about that project is that activism does work. These were students who pushed the university to do this project. Um, and so, you know, they had the, the, the wherewithal to push an institution as august as UVA, started by slave owner Thomas Jefferson, to say, you need to own your history. And, and you need to acknowledge the men, women, and children who made this world possible, who made this beautiful campus possible. Um, and so I do think that activism can be at the core, very much so, of these new statements. And I think, you know, in our case, as I, as, as I look back on, on what we actually did produce, one of the challenges certainly is that the monument form, the memorial form that we've inherited in many ways is a Western form. And when you try to give names, figuration, dates, you know, if, if you're an indigenous person, if you were an enslaved person, anyone um, under, you know, struggling under the yoke of power, you don't have that register. The history books don't keep, keep your life alive. And so you have to come up with these more creative, alternative forms of commemoration. And, and, and I think what Paul said about Toni Morrison's absolutely right. It's song where you find those memories, it's narrative, it's music. So there are already other commemorative forms that exist beyond bronze and stone um, and, and, and wood. And, and I think we need to acknowledge that as well as, as we seek new forms and, and, and work that I know someone like, like Joel's been doing. Yes, I, I agree with you, Mabel. The, uh, the idea that when we did surveys, uh, the teens and I did surveys of people uh, wanting to understand more about monuments and what was their favorite monument, some of what the Philadelphia Monument Lab had already been collecting as views of uh, individual citizenry, um, there was a, quite a surprising result of one woman who wanted to have a, uh, a mobile monument of aromas to visit neighborhoods, to then uh, memorialize smells uh, and odors as a space of, um, of life. And so it was just very amazing over the 200 surveys. I think that that was the most surprising one for me, but the offer of uh, how there are uh, alternate formats for uh, memorializing and uh, monumental work that looms large and that um, people are in that kind of frame, they are the big idea, so. Um, and actually, I mean, Paul, I love, let's just say, you know, a thousand points for quoting Toni Morrison. That is like the queen mother for me. Uh, but Joel, I wanna talk to you a little bit about the work that you do at, um, at, at the Intercultural Leadership Institute and Monument Lab. And some of these processes that um, Mabel and Lamerchi are talking about, how have you seen those um, instituted in real time? When we removed the Columbus statue, immediately um, elected officials wanted to erect the statue to another person, right? And and although representation matters, you know, and it was a Tongva woman who they wanted to create the statue around, we 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 had to really push back and be like, well, no, like there hasn't been a like any type of communal process to decide what what would go there. And in speaking to elders, many of the California Indian elders here in in, in Los Angeles. It was the same response, like, why do we want to commemorate a person? Why do we want to replicate the same systems of oppression that have been imposed on us? Why can't we commemorate nature? Why can't we work to restore the, this, this place, this land, into 
to what it originally was. What if nature coming back to the city was a form of monument? What do the oak trees bring to us, right? This, this, this ecosystem that, that oak trees create, um, the community that oak trees create, not just between other oak trees, but between animals and, and, and that symbiotic relationship that they need to have in order to survive. And for them, it was like, this is what the city needs to do. We need to figure out what, it, what symbiotic relationship we have to one another. You know, to, to you know, for, for indigenous communities to act, you know, ask for land back, is, doesn't mean that because lands return to them that they're gonna kick people out of the land. Like, that's not what it means. It, it means we're gonna find ways to live together, to, go, to coexist, not just simply coexist, but to thrive together. So what, why can't we start that process by shaping our, our physical space. Grand Park, where the Columbus statue was, was grounds where there, there was a, a slave auction. You know, it used to be a, a Tongo village there. So there's a lot of, you know, erased history there. And so we pushed to have some sort of public process. We launched, they launched an RFP, the LA County Department of Arts and Culture, about a month ago. And it was to reimagine what that space could be, to reimagine what monuments could be what monuments could feel like, what monuments could teach us. Um, you know, monuments for the most part, we just see visually, but we don't experience. So what can, what can that experience be? How does technology now come into play, right? What if you walk up to a certain area and, and all of a sudden your phone pings and there's all these testimonials that were collected by folks who visited that space who can simply text a number, share their experience or their history or a testimonial, and it's captured forever and you walk into these spaces and it's there without any sort of hierarchy on who gets to decide what goes on a plaque. And so that's kind of the work that we've been doing, you know, and it's, and it's, been, it's been a joy, you know, to, to radicalize elders too, to think about like, you know, political strategies to get this done, you know, do direct actions and not direct actions in a sense of like, you know, uh, blocking streets or whatever, even though that's important to do, but creative actions. What if we wrap all the trees in downtown LA with, you know, with colors that um, represent something to to the Tongva people? You know, um, why don't we start bringing their forms of memorials more into public space, right? Like these ancestor poles, these prayer poles that are decorated with colors and beads and shells, um, and make those more visible. So yeah, I mean, these are conversations that. Um, I love to have because it just pushes us to reimagine our, or like our entire public space. Yes. Um, I'd like to comment on on, on that. Uh, there is recently a uh, uh, a grant for reimagining and radical practices in art, and one of the um, uh, kind of paradigms that has not really been explored in Boston is the relationship between Black and indig Indigenous people and how that is uh, sovereign uh, uh, recognition of sovereignty with us from the 1600s as a, or the 1500s really, as a 500 year shared history. And how many monuments are missing with, that have that voice that um, are there? And how many that go to the Crispus Attucks Memorial in the Boston Common, and he is allegedly the, 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 man, the first man to die in the American Revolution, um, in 1770, as that is being called for by a formerly enslaved man in 1857, begins this story of um, us understanding that Crispus was um, the descendant, he was the child of an African descended man and a native uh, Wampanoag woman, and that these shared histories are here to be recognized, but you don't see that when you go to the, um, that memorial. That's not the story that's told. So um, uh, I'm in, in agreement with Joel if the, we can have some barcode or some um, innovative device that tells the stories at these monuments that are not usually the discussion or what people come to the monument with. So, uh, mm -hmm. um, and actually, I, I, we did have a question um, that came in about contextualizing problematic monuments and whether or not that's enough. Um, is it enough to have these counter monuments? Is it enough to have a QR code that someone can scan? And Paul, I'm actually really interested to hear from you, given um, all of the research and work you've done surrounding the Berlin Wall as a place of refuge for some um, radical people like Angela Davis, but also um, Germany's overall reckoning with this really dark and violent past 
and what they've done to kind of change that concerning public art and monuments. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, one, one main thing I want to put out there is that there's not one way to memorialize. We need multiple voices. We need um, non-hierarchical and we need to hear from people's direct experiences. Um, you know, I, I've uh, done a lot of research and, and just wrote a book um, uh, about the Berlin Wall and American artists um, who spent time in Berlin while the wall was up and came back after. It's called A Wall of Our Own. I'm a, a Jewish and queer white person living in America. When I was growing up, I was told, don't go to Germany. Don't think about Germany. That's the site of trauma. Um, and it was actually being a college student um, studying in, in Europe for a semester and being in Berlin, I felt more comfortable being Jewish in Berlin than I did anywhere else in Europe. And in part, it was because um, look, Germany has a heavy weight of history, uh, a burden to bear, um, but there, there were scars that were visible. There were large memorials, there were small memorials. There was conversation, there had been curriculum um, for more than a generation. Um, there were laws in place that banned hateful symbols like the swastika. Um, and so I felt the effect of that, and I wasn't alone. There was a, multiple generations of people who made pilgrimages to Berlin. I felt haunted there, but I also felt at home. And what I realized while I was there, I, I thought, you know, when you, you know, sometimes you go to a space and the energy is, is intense, and almost like you're walking through something viscous, and you're going through it. And I was like, wow, I'm here. And I thought, okay if you are black or indigenous and walking in any square foot of what we now call the United States, how is that any different? And I remember that first trip that I took in 2004, that was on my mind. Another thing was on my mind was like, we have these histories of uprisings, of police brutality that have um, resulted in, in, in uprisings that have had profound effect across hundreds of American cities. And I had read about it in, in my courses, but I had really only seen small markers. And I it was being in Germany that, that reminded me that the stories that are violent, um, that are part of our history need to be reckoned with. And also transformation is possible if you invest in it, if you let it happen over time, if you have different techniques of memory. And just to fast forward, a, a really powerful moment for me that I got the great fortune to share with Joel um, the Monument Lab Fellows um, went to Berlin last summer. Um, and uh, thanks to the Goethe Institute for a project we were we are working on called Shaping the Past. And um, there is a project called Stumblestones, uh, Stupersteine, that started as a kind of renegade art project, renegade public art project that has now been officially adopted in um, across Europe and, and several other places in the world where there are small markers outside of the homes of um, Jewish people and other people who were politically persecuted that marks exactly where they um, were deported to and and if they were murdered or survived. And, and Joel and I got to see one be installed. And I think just the ability to have multiple stories, to not rush to a race, but really understand how public symbols are connected to systems. It's important to see um, sites and visit sites that across generations we can speak to one another. But if you don't invest in curriculum, if you don't invest in the kind of rigor behind specific policies, the fact that Germany um, supported reparations, this is the framework we should be thinking about in the United States. Um, Memory-based, financial-based forms of repair that actually take into account the work of healing um, and monumental justice and care. Right, right. Um, and just want to, you know, give us a quick time check. We're kind of entering into the latter half of the hour. Um, so again, to the audience, if you guys have any questions for our panelists, please go to slido.com and use the event code public art to submit your question. We do have another question from Tom um, that actually I think kind of ties into what I was about to ask. And um, Joel, you said something really uh, something that just really struck me. You said um, building bridges to what comes after, right? What comes after this? And then 
um, Paul, you're talking about different techniques of memory, right? Um, and I think it's important to maybe take a step back. And so the question from Tom is, can you explain who controls public art in this country? And we were talking about this a little bit, about how the process can be confusing and convoluted. Um, and then he also asks, why would anyone allow monuments to be, to, uh, sorry, why would anyone allow monuments to racists to be erected in the first place? <laughs> Loaded question. Feel free to jump in, <laughs> whoever wants to. I'll give an example with, with the Sarah statue. Actually, both the Columbus statue and the Sarah statue are tied in. Um, both of these were gifted to the city of Los Angeles by, you know, private parties. Um, private parties who wanted to push their narrative. We, we, and I say this because I want to give license to folks to take action into their own hands. Um, but to do the research, you know, behind what they're going to do, um, we we assessed correctly that the Sarah statue was not a historical monument, that it wasn't an art object, it wasn't this, like you know this sculpture that was worth worth much beyond its weight in scrap metal. Um, it was a copy. It is a copy of a copy. Um, we know that the city owned it. We knew that the city paid to install it and place it on a pedestal and we knew that the city controlled the land it was where it was put you know installed at so all these different layers right who controls the land who has oversight of, of like you know the the city's art collection in this case but we also banked that it wasn't worth anything that you know we learned from the columbus statue that all the energy time that these elected officials put into either opposing it or or removing it um, the county paid to have an appraisal done of the statue, and it came back as being worth zero dollars. Zero dollars. Um, and you know, these were questions we were asking. Well, who who attributes value to these monuments, right? How is it attributed? And and you know, the commissioners, when I said this, they kind of just balked. You know, when I said like it's, it's white supremacy that adds value to these things. Um, and so we, you know, we we banked on. The city not pressing charges that we removed the Sarah statue because one, it wasn't an art object, even though it was part of their art collection. It wasn't going to be worth anything. Um, we know folks at the Department of Cultural Affairs who has oversight over these monuments. So we said, you know, we guessed correctly. Like, if we remove this, we won't face anything. And, you know, gladly <laughs> we assessed correctly because a week later, um, a couple council members, um, you know, put forth the motion. And in that motion, they described this as, a sector, uh, as an act of civil disobedience because the city did not have a process to, a public process to talk, talk about these monuments, but also deassessing them. That term deassessing last year would scare the shit out of people. And the fact that it was introduced in a motion without any, any pushback just goes to show how much this work can advance if people really push. And Mabel, I saw that you were about to say something as well. Do you have something to add to what Joel just said? Um, I, I mean, I just want to go back to maybe the question of, well, why would you put racist um, in the public sphere? And I think it's partially because the modern world, right, that comes out of the European colonial project needed those hierarchies precisely, I think, Joel's point to say, what and who is valuable and what and who is not and is expendable. Which isn't to say that those, you know, who benefit don't find those at the bottom useful because they in fact do, um, but that their lives are in fact disposable. Um, and, and I think those people who have those advantages, who have opportunities, who benefit from, from, from whiteness have the power. They define the public. They, they pay for the civic. They're the ones that pay for these things. Um, and they're not just individuals, but they can be also institutions. Um, racism is systemic. And so, you know, this has come to shape a landscape of representation in, in, in not just in the US, but, but all over the world. I mean, we, we see this in, in many different places in terms of like how the monument form, the memorial is used to, to establish power. There's a really great example of Erdogan in Turkey, who put literally within a year put up a monument <laughs> to the, the, those who defeated the coup, I think, that happened the year before. I mean, huge, soaring, right, as a statement of his authority. 
Um, and so, 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 so these forms are malleable and they, they become useful um, as I think, as, as Paul started at the beginning, of expressions of power. Um, and, and I think particularly in, in, in the US, we have to recognize that whiteness has determined a lot of this sim symbolism and meaning of our public sphere at the expense of those who've been excluded from it. Yes, I think also uh, to add to what you're saying, I totally agree uh, about that, uh, the comments that you made. Uh, and thinking about the uh, Shaw 54th Memorial that's in the Boston Common, um, and it being one of the 10 most treasured monuments in the country uh, as an art, art object, as a um, memory of the Civil War and the battle at Fort Wagner waged by the first troop to be allowed to fight in the Civil War that was a Black regiment. Yet in the, the, uh, the forming of this monument, we have a white man who is on the horse uh, leading this regiment raised above the troop. Um, and the original form of this monument uh, that uh, uh, was proposed was only uh, Colonel Robert Shaw on his horse. And the Shaw family then insisted uh, on him being flanked by the men of the 54th War Black. As this is a, um, a uh, problem for the Black community, even in raising soldiers and recruiting soldiers for that regiment, because there were no Black officers to be allowed to exist. And so the controlling of that narrative and that, that uh, circumstance rest in this monument um, as you look at it and the call for uh, leg legislation that would allow by 1982 the names of the black soldiers to be added to the back of uh, the memorial that had only heretofore um, uh, contained the, the names of the white officers of that troop uh, shows how this public piece of art uh, then also engenders uh, policy development and reflects it is some reflection of what you were saying, Paul, uh, about how uh, comfortable you are in the space and what you uh, imagine or reimagine as you look at these these uh, artifacts. I call them I call them monumental artifacts of, of time. Um, and so the tensions that were present are still reflected in that hierarchy of of this sculpture even though it is very beautiful and very rendered uh, rendered very well and the restoration project that is happening right now will bring more of this issue forward. Um, we, we have these, um, these places of spatial justice yet to reckon with. Yeah, I, I just want to add, um, appreciating the, the specific stories that are being brought up, whether um, on Boston Common or um, throughout LA, these are not just inconsequential figures. These structure time, space, power in cities. But that question of you know why do we why do we build monuments to 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 white racist figures? Um, we elect white racist figures. We appoint and reward white racist figures. And so that you know as 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 Mabel noted, like the the systemic nature. We have to, when we think about monuments, really think of them almost as like, if you're going to take away a monument, you have to rip out the roots underneath it. You have to really see what it spreads to. And I think that, you know, part of this is that we're, we're used to thinking about, um, I think, spaces as neutral, you know, and they're not neutral. Um, whether it's histories of segregation or, or um, contemporary policing, that, you know, we could think a lot about how to actually go about thinking that monuments that we've inherited are not permanent. They've required maintenance money and mindsets to keep them up and that they're not universal. They're actually reflective, despite any of the intentions of these builders, they're reflective of, of histories of division. And if you start from that point, you start to see the landscape differently and then you realize, well, there's more to be said, more to be appreciated um, than necessarily what's on the pedestal, and it can be a both and. But we recognize that they're not neutral and they don't simply exist outside of, out of our power. We have the power to 
change them and change the systems that that um, that some of them, if not many of them, support. Yeah. Right. I want to give an example, a quick example. Um, so LA County is one of the largest counties in, in the country. Um, and you would imagine that it's arts program funding would reflect that. But instead, the civic art program actually has a larger pot of funds than the funding that goes to arts programming across the, count, uh, across the country. And that's just, that still to this day just blows my mind, right? That there's more investment in, in a lot of public art that is inside buildings, you know, that the community doesn't get to see. And that there's so much money that goes in maintaining those, those, those pieces that are mostly done by white men, you know? And, and to the question about, um, you know, like erasing history, you know, it's like, we get conditioned to see, you know, kind of people who do good things be awarded figures of humans, right? You have the Oscars, you have the trophy you get when you participate in some sport. You're getting handed a human being of like, okay, you're 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 valuable, you're valid, and so we get conditioned to think that that's the only way to recognize people as valuable as as having dignity. Period. And I think, and it's mostly men. So we got to think about, you know, also undoing the patriarch the patriarchy that exists within that. Um, and just a quick time update: we have about eight minutes left, and we have, I think. I think we'll probably be able to fit in one last question. I think this may be the last one for the night, unfortunately. Um, but I think this is a good one. This one is from Janine. And this person asks, how does the artist fit into this, especially for historical monuments? How much does personal self-expression contribute? And I think the other question is, how can artists really um, use not only their talent, but also their voice and their power to enact change? And I think. All of you are great examples of that, but um, yes. So how does the artist fit into this and how much does personal self-expression contribute? I don't know, I guess as the artist, I, I can take that one <laughs> or I'll start it off. Um, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a difference between being asked to do something by the community and being that conduit for, for, for that imagining to to come into form. And there's another thing to be commissioned by, or to produce propaganda, you know? Um, so as an artist, I think it's important to like, really think about your value system. What, what am I contributing to? Even, even if, it, if it's a you know, well-paid commission for a project, what is it that I'm exactly contributing to? Is my, are my actions erasing somebody else's experience in the city that, that I live in? Um, and people forget that these monuments that are coming down, the majority of them are not like unique objects. They're replicas. They're mass produced. They were mass produced, you know? Um, so to an extent, an artist kind of let goals of their, of, of any, um, I don't know, of any, what would you call it? <laughs> any attachment to this, to this thing, right? Like if, if it's not done within community, if it's not done within a process that, that um, includes, you know, the citizens of a place, and I think you let go of that that, that attachment, and the people like murals um, get to decide what what they get to see on a daily basis. I also think that um, in considering artists as citizen, artist citizen taking into account the the frame of what is just and what is spatially and socially just with community and having co-design co modeling, if, uh, if you will, with community is a process in a practice for a public artist that uh, should be there. Um, uh, although artists have much license to, to do their work um, as individuals, there is this collective uh, self-recovery that the, the citizen, the artist citizen uh, would be reflective of to show a just mirror of community, of uh, voices, and, and uplifting the um, the ideas that are um, pertinent and reflective and 
if I am a grandmother, I want to take my granddaughter past something that I can be proud of and talk with her about in my community. So um, while many of the, uh, the monuments are aesthetically beautiful, are they subjects that we want to engender? with our children and with uh, community members. So um, in those kind of considerations, designing within that frame becomes one of uh, recognizing that from the 1500s forward, we have been in this uh, a paradigm of white possessive logic. Like, you know, this is a space that's own. I, I look at the, um, the essay by um, Jamaica Kincaid who says in history, I haven't been considered in the narrative yet. So who is manning that narrative for, as an, for me as an artist to operate in as I consider everyone, as Joel has said, you know, not to erase someone else. What am I going to take in as my breath of art? Yeah, I mean, I, I would just maybe just add this little thought. Um, I heard Albie Sachs, um, who wrote the Constitution for South Africa, lost his arm in the fight against apartheid, say, you know, when he was in the struggle, you know, people would say, well, Alvi, why, why do you support artists? What is art important for you? What, we, we, need, we need to be down for the freedom struggle. We need, and, and, and his response was, what art allowed him to do was exactly imagine what freedom would be. And it gave him that space to think about what that would mean. And I always thought about that as really the power of creativity and the necessity of artistic expression in, in struggles for liberation. Mm. Yeah, I, I want to echo that. And, it's, you know, art is not ornaments. Art is not luxury. Art is the way that we knit together our democracy. And so I want to just um, flip the terms of the question a bit and say, because um, I know artists are going to show up. I know artists are going to have their ears to the ground. They are going to be resourceful. A little bit of investment in the work of artists goes a, a long ways. So I want to say, what are we going to do to resource artists and to bring them into the process, not at the end, but from the very beginning? You know, I'm, I'm reaching you from Philadelphia in a city that is in the midst of some really intense monument um, debates, clashes, and um, the, the kind of moments, this has been building for many years, but um, as of June 1st, our um, public art office was eliminated. The final two, em the two employees were moved to another office, cultural fund slashed. It was a $4 million budget. It was already undervalued. And the first weekend of the uprising protests, there was $18 million of police overtime. So I think what's really important that we have to really think about is and I mean, when I say we, I'm talking about cities, I'm talking about institutions, I'm talking about our communities. How do we invest in artists so that they're able to lead the way? They're able to help us from the beginning, not think about, is this a square or a circle, but push out the boundaries of what's possible. You know, I think one of, of Monument Lab's like dream projects is uh, a, a national, a federal WPA where artists are um, gathering information and ideas and treating monuments, not just in the Gilded Age trophies, Joel, brilliant point that you bring up um, about human form, but they're really organically thinking about the past, present, and future so that we understand what we bring forward with us. So however we invest in artists and create space for their vision, that's going to be part of our health, care, and justice uh, moving forward. I agree with Thank you. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry, guys. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, we're just running right up until eight o'clock. Um, and I don't know if if we have time to continue. Um, just waiting for an update from the team. But um, I think Paul, what you said about pushing out the boundaries of what's possible was was really great. Um, and I think I think yeah, I think we are gonna have to wrap it up. Um, but this conversation certainly isn't over for everyone listening. I encourage you to make sure that you are following all of these folks and the very amazing work that they're doing in the art field. Um, on top of that, I uh, just wanted to mention that we do have another event coming up on July 30th about something similar, sort of, that's tangential. Um, it's a collaboration with the Boston University Initiative. 
um, on cities in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. So it's called Black Boston. So the series will feature some transformative Black leaders here um, across greater Boston. And it'll basically provide a forum to kind of examine our city's progress or lack of progress, really, um, and where we kind of fall short. So um, you guys should definitely tune in on July 30th. You guys can go to wbur.org slash events to learn more. And as I said, this is definitely a growing um, and uh, nebulous conversation. It's always changing. It's always going to change. But I really want to thank everyone here for joining us in this part of the conversation tonight. So thank you, Joel, Lamurchi, Mabel, and Paul so much. I learned so much from all of you. I have notes on my notepad. All of you guys are speaking so much truth. And yes, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to everybody watching. And you know, I just hope everyone has a good night. Thank you guys. Thank you. Much.